Pardon me? Is it divided by M squared? No, it's a pressure times a, a, a time. Uh, so if you're at one atmosphere of pressure, it takes 10 minus 8 seconds to get a monolayer on the surface. If you're at 10 minus 8 atmospheres, it takes one second. Does that make sense? But Pressure. So if you have a low pressure, we're dividing by low pressure, this is kind of tough. Well, let's see. Let's see. Uh, <coughs> this is the, well, the pressure time product, pressure times time, equals the Langmuir, okay? Okay, so, so the unit should be atmosphere seconds. Okay, because of this. So if I'm at one atmosphere of pressure, the time is 10 minus 8 seconds. This is, the Langmuir is just a constant. Okay? This, this product is equal to a constant. So if I'm at 10 minus 8 seconds, it takes one second. If I'm at, or 10 minus 8, uh, if I'm at 10 minus 8 atmospheres, it takes one second. If I'm at 10 minus 16, it takes 10 to the 8 seconds to form a monolayer. So does that, that make sense? Okay. Um, the Langmuir is just a constant, which is the pressure time product. Which I actually hadn't written down before. So that's, thanks. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to keep talking a little bit about cold welding. And you might wonder why we spend all this time on cold welding. But part of it is because <coughs> um, we're going to get into the things that limit the strength of all joints. And so this is just kind of an introduction to all the, the stuff. The inherent strength of all bonds we talked about last time is very, very high. You just bring two atoms together uh, and they want to bond and they have primary bonds, you'll get millions of PSI if you're just talking about those two atoms. You know, that's a very small area, so you don't have a lot of force, but nonetheless, it's on a per unit area, the strength is very, very large. However, the problem with most joints is they never come anywhere close. Typically only five or ten percent of their theoretical strength of the primary bonds, and that's because you don't always form the primary bonds. If you have contamination on the surface, you end up with Van der Waals bonds, which are one-tenth as strong. Uh, all adhesive bonding, basically, is Van der Waals bonding, and there's no primary bonding that goes on in adhesive bonding between the adherent and the adhesive. Surface roughness creates a problem um, that typically, we'll show today, you never get more. If you just take two things apart and put them together, because of surface roughness, you never get about more than about one-third contacted area. So you lose two-thirds of your strength. Uh, even if you didn't have contamination, you lose two-thirds of your strength just because of surface roughness. In fact, people have done those experiments in an ultra-high vacuum, 10 to minus 10 or 10 to minus 12 uh, atmospheres, um, and they will, where they have something on the order of 10,000 seconds to, to uh, create a surface and then put it, um, two surfaces and put it back together. And they typically will get, in the best cases, only 10 to 15 percent of the original bond strength because of surface roughness, they, which leaves essentially on a microscopic scale voids. In the other cases, a lot of the joints we have, whether they're braze joints or adhesive bonded joints, have big macroscopic voids, things you could see with your eye or things that you could see in a 50x microscope. And those things are going to weaken things. How they fracture? How they fracture in the uh, well, they have to go with the material that can be cleaved, and so a lot of the experiments originally were done on things like salt crystals, single crystals of sodium fluoride or lithium fluoride, because they could cleave them um, and they would fracture along a, a nice flat uh, crystallographic plane. They have done it with gold, supposedly, but uh, I think, I'm not positive, um, I think um, that what they did is they vapor deposited and ended up with a, a nice clean gold sur surface. And then they put something else on top, but you still have the surface roughness problem. So it wasn't as if they created two new gold surfaces. Gold is too ductile to just fracture uh, simply. But when they do cleave things, they can get atomically smooth uh, planes of, of, uh, of products, uh, materials, and then try to put them back together. Um, and they do get surprisingly high strengths by doing that if you don't have the contamination around in the vacuum. Uh, the voids, and that's basically like little cracks, uh, are going to limit the strength. 
by the fracture, fracture mechanics, and now that you've already had those DVDs on uh, uh, the fr uh, fracture toughness and stuff, you, you should be able to follow that. Um, liquids are often, often used to overcome surface roughness. That's what we do at adhesive bonding, we do it in soldering, we do it in brazing, and we do it in fusion welding. We basically put a liquid in between the two surfaces to take care of all the hills and valleys. We don't try to put the surfaces together, we put a liquid in between to get 100% area of contact. Uh, we're going to talk with the different joining processes on how the contamination is removed either mechanically or chemically. In cold welding, it's generally removed mechanically. Sometimes you do both, but uh, generally just mechanically. In the Langmuir, is this 10 minus 8 atmosphere per second. So that's what we've talked about. Um, and I said, we're going to spend a fair amount of time on cold welding. You might say, well, why do we bother to talk about cold welding? It turns out, if you actually get down to the number of welds made in the world, or joints made in the world, the vast majority of them are essentially by cold welding process. Anybody have any idea what the uh, product is that has all these cold welds in it? What's in your computer? It's plastic, but there's also chips, right? And you have to get the um, you have to get the current, or you have to get the signal in and out of the chip. And so this is this is an encapsulation process. But in order to, you essentially have these little wires that have to be bonded to the chip. And typically, I think the the Pentium Four has got 420 bonds around the chip. Um, and we'll talk about that. But that basically is a cold welding process that we're going to go into. In fact, when I say there's more of those joints than any other, I haven't actually figured out if it exceeds all the other joints. It may not, but but just in general, how would you estimate how many of those? Again, I'm going to try to turn this into an estimation class. Um, how might you estimate how many semiconductor lead bonds? I just told you the Pentium 4 has 400 bonds around it, right? And you got a piece of memory chip you know, DRAM or something, it may have, well, some of the DRAMs are, well, those are 168 pin, right, leads or something, or 100, whatever, 44, or whatever the number is on different DRAMs. If I, if I know that I have, let's just say, 100 bonds per chip, now I could actually say that I have 200 bonds per chip, because I have to make the bond with the lead coming in, and then it has to bond to something going out, right? So is that for every, every connection, I got two bonds at least. But 100 bonds per chip, and now I need, all I need to know is how many chips they make in the world. How many chips do they make in the world? Anybody have an idea? How big is the semiconductor industry? How many billions of dollars a year? Anybody have an idea? How big is Intel? Intel is about 25 or 30 billion, are they? Something like that. So Intel is what, 25 percent? It's actually probably less than that, but let's just say, let's just say we're roughly order of magnitude to 100 billion dollars. What's the value of a chip? Ten dollars, hundred dollars. Order of magnitude, it's somewhere between ten to ten to a thousand, right? Typically. So we just use 100, and I end up with, oops, oh, I did, I did $10 a chip on my thing, okay. This is assume $10 a chip on average, um, and I end up with 10 to the 12th bonds, okay. So that's quite a few bonds, and many of them are cold wells, um, and we're going we're gonna to go into that. Now, um, <coughs> A number of years ago, actually 27 to be exact, some uh, people in the semiconductor industry were interested in these cold welds. And <coughs> actually, I'll go back and show you the actual wire bonding process. Um, the wire bonding process, and you have this in your handouts, but um, actually, they call this, this one's called a sonotrode. Uh, because they actually vibrate it ultrasonically, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But they have a little wire. That little wire typically is gold or aluminum, 
We'll talk about why they use those two materials in a little bit. But it's about one thousandth of an inch in diameter. In fact, they usually talk about it in microns, and 25 microns is one one thousandth of an inch. Uh, a lot of the chips nowadays are using 20 micron wire, so eight tenths of a mil, um, which is what fraction of a human hair? You should know all these things, you know, how thick is your hair? It's about 60, 60 microns is your, about three mils. Depends on whether you got thick hair or thin hair, but uh, anyway, about 60 to 75 microns is, <clears throat> is the uh, thickness of a human hair. So this is about one third the diameter of a human hair, these little gold wires. <clears throat> and they, they basically, like a, you can think of it almost like a sewing machine, and the wire is the, is the thread, and they have this little machine that comes down, and it can, the wire threads through the, the end of it, and it squeezes it down, presses the wire up against the surface, and then the sewing machine, um, what do you call that in a sewing machine? But the, the piece moves over, and it makes a second bond over here, and you've got something going from the chip to the, uh, to the what we call the outer lead bonds. Um, another variation is oops, as follows. You basically have this little gold wire. You've got the thing that feeds through it. And in this case, they actually show uh, a situation where you actually melt the end of the wire with a hydrogen torch um, and make a little um, bead on the end. And then you come down and smash that bead into the surface and you make your... Uh, your bond that way, okay? There are whole books written on this subject, such as wire bonding and microelectronics. And I'll pass this around, but if you want to actually see some of these bonds, um, actually these are defective bonds that they have pictures of in the book, but here's one of the bonds and you can see how the wire comes in. This one actually melted and then they squeezed it and it spread across the surface and it looks like some sort of little slug r running across the surface of the silicon. Um, in any case, <coughs> uh, the experiment these other guys <coughs> ran back in 1975 was they took a piece of steel, they took, they gold plated it, so they electroplated with gold, they then took a bar of, or actually a little strip, I think it was about 10 thousandths of an inch or so, yeah, of gold, cheap, and another one. And then they did symmetrically gold electroplate again on a steel substrate. And they just squeeze this whole thing at different pressures and tore it apart <clears throat> to find out where the bond was and um, uh, how good the bond was. So you've got three interfaces that could potentially bond. The two, the gold-gold sheet interface, the gold-gold interface with steel. What's the difference between those two? I mean, they're all go all three of them are gold gold interfaces, chemically. But the one that's or the the interface in the middle, which is gold and gold, has got nice soft backing. This one's got a soft backing and a hard backing, right? The steel is compared to gold, which is a relatively soft metal. This this was a piece of hardened steel, had about ten times the strength, and therefore that very thin layer, but. That very thin layer would not uh, would not deform, whereas you get more deformation here than you would here, because this interface, once half of this interface is not deforming. So where do you think they got the strongest bonds? The middle interface or one of the gold uh, steel gold plated? Pardon me. Middle. middle. Why? Because it's deform. Right, and you deform. No, well, not only deforms the roughness, but it actually spreads the thing out, and you get a you actually pancake this, if you will, and that causes a shearing across the interface. There's less shear up at this interface than there's at this interface. You you basically are you're deforming the uh, the asperities. Okay, so I got these rough surfaces, and I can squeeze it together together, but in fact, I'm just deforming the asperities. If I really want to get rid of those asperities, I actually will shear them away.
until the thing smears and all the mountains, mountain peaks get flattened by the shearing action. And so one of the things they learned in this experiment and they proved was that just a straight downward force doesn't give you a, a very strong bond. You really need a sideways shearing force. You don't want to just squeeze things together. You want to slide them sideways. In fact, if you were to take these pieces of uh, foam and look at them very carefully, if I just put one on top of the other with no particular force, I may have only two or three percent. This, this is the apparent area, is this re rectangle here. But if I just put them together under their own weight, the actual area of contact is maybe only one or two percent of the apparent area. That's the apparent area. The actual area is just a few of these little spots where they contact. And I can increase that contact by applying more force, but it's not too hard to imagine that I can squeeze that all the way, but I'm still going to have some voids in there. Where two valleys come together, I may never get the valleys to reach each other. And in fact, you can go through and do an analysis of that, which this is also in your notes. And the analysis basically says, macroscopically, if I take two surfaces and squeeze them together, then the contact pressure macroscopically is whatever load I'm applying, some, some contact pressure, over the apparent contact area of A apparent. So I'm squeezing with some force F. And the maximum I can get is the yield strength of the material. Uh, at the yield strength, so that's the, the, um, <coughs> the uh, contact pressure if you look at it ma macroscopically. If you look at it microscopically, I actually have rough surfaces, and the contact pressure is that same force divided by the true contact area. The true contact area is never going to, might start out with low forces, might only be 1 or 2 percent. That true contact area increases as I apply the pressure. It turns out the maximum pressure between contact, what we call the indentation hardness of a material, is about three times the yield strength of the material. The indentation pressure is nothing more than if I have a punch and I have an infinite solid piece of material here, and I try to squeeze that into the surface, it's different than if I just have a simple compression test where I take two materials and squeeze them, and they can flare out as I deform them. Here, I actually have to not just move the material right underneath the punch, but I actually have to move all this material and so I'm actually deforming about three times the volume of the flat surface as I am over here. And a rule of thumb is that the indentation pressure is three times the yield strength, compressive yield strength of the material. The compressive yield strength is measured here, but the indentation pressure, when I change the geometry to something like this, is about three times that. You can actually go and prove for non-work hardening material, and if any of your mechanical engineers, in something called slipline flow field, the true number for non-work hardening materials is 1, point, 1 plus pi over 2, or 2.57. But materials actually work harden, and they get a little stronger as you deform them. And so the rule of thumb for a metallurgist rather than a mechanical engineer is uh, to uh, uh, is that about, you just say the indentation hardness is about three times the compressive yield strength. Is there a rule of thumb for compressive yield strength? No. Uh, different metals have different types of compressive yield strength. Cubic metals, the compressive yield strength, and cubic metals are most of the ones we deal with, iron, copper, aluminum. Um, the compressive yield strength is pretty much equal to the tensile yield strength. For hexagonal close pack metals like zinc or certain types of titanium, it can be very different depending on, because you now have an asymmetric crystal. And the, the, the way it deforms in compression is different than the way it does in tension. For cubic metals, it's essentially the same. But for non-cubic metals, there, you really have to measure it. But for, uh, for cubic metals, it's not a big deal. You just use the, the tensile. <coughs> um, so in any case, if you put all this together, you can prove by these simple little formulas down here, that the actual con the, the maximum true area of contact where I actually get yielding of the metal is only about one third. The true area of contact compared to the, tr the apparent area. If I just take these two formulas and solve for A of T over A of A, 
when the forces are equal, then you end up with the actual, the true area of contact is only about one third of the, uh, the apparent area of contact. That means that if I just do what, if I just do a simple normal squeeze, normal force um, uh, compressive squeeze, I'm not going to get particularly good bonding. Uh, that means that if I am going to do some bonding, I really need to do something to have this wire spread out. And in fact, typically, that little gold wire, which starts out at maybe 20 microns, this was one where they heat it with a torch, but this is one where over here, and actually, this actually, there are examples, most of the stuff is not heated with a torch. And they bas basically just mechanically spread it out <coughs> to where the diameter is two or three times the original wire diameter. So I'm getting lots of shear across that interface to break down these things, okay? And get, if with shear, I can get 100% area of contact because uh, I'm just wearing the thing down very rapidly. So um, that's contact area. Let's talk about specific types of welds. Um, one weld is the friction weld. In a friction weld, you take a bar of material, typically a round materi uh, material, but not necessarily in all cases. I'll go through another in a second. And you take another bar and you spin the second bar, with re and the, the first is usually stationary, although they can counter rotate, but you need relative uh, motion. And you spin the two, uh, one with respect to the other, and squeeze them together and the friction of a lot of force squeezing this way and spinning this way causes the thing to heat up very rapidly. There's some videotapes that we'll see at some point. Maybe we'll do it next Thursday or something if I'm not here, Chris, uh, to do those videos of high energy density. You and I can talk about it. Um, so I may be here Thursday and Friday, and if not on Thursday, we'll just do those videotapes of uh, but one of them shows friction welding. But the whole thing will glow red uh, just from friction of heating the two. You keep pushing as the material softens in the center, it extrudes out. <coughs> just like I was showing here in compression, the material flares out. If you flare it enough, it'll actually turn around on itself um, as you squeeze it together. And you end up making a friction weld. Anybody know where? Many of you own a number of these in friction the welds. Yep. Yep. Friction. The the valve in the engine. You're right. The the top of the valve is usually a high temperature material, and the stem is a high strength material. And they friction weld those together, and then machine it off. Also, in the drivetrain, um, typically you have a universal joint. You know, as your your uh, your. Uh, uh, Power is coming down. What do you call the uh, the uh, uh, not the crankshaft, but the uh, trans? Well, it comes out of the transmission. The bar that goes from the transmission to the differential. What do you call it? Drive shaft. There you go. Drive shaft. The drive shaft has two knuckles. Has knuckles on either end, which create a, what we call a universal joint. The universal joint is nothing more more than a C-shaped piece of metal that matches with another C-shaped piece of metal, but at 90 degrees. And then you have a little cross. In a metal in between, and this, there are bearings in here, so this thing can flex in any direction. So, you're, because your drive shaft is your, if your axle, if your rear axle goes over a bump, it's kind of going over the bump at a different time than the front axle, and you want some flexibility of that drive shaft so you don't break it off. So, the universal joint, you have to put this C shaped piece onto this circular shaft, and typically that's friction welded. Um, although, now, in some things, like some of the pickup trucks, they're going to graphite composite drive shafts um, because um, they're trying to get better performance, and graphite composites are getting cheaper. But uh, in most cars, they use a tubular steel um, drive shaft, and they friction weld that, uh, that knuckle to, of the universal joint onto either end of the drive shaft. Uh, so you got friction welds there. <clears throat> there are more important friction welds to you. You don't know they're more important to you until you fly in an aircraft. And you didn't know it until I tell you right now, most of you. But they actually, the turbine engine has got these great big turbine wheels that hold the, the uh, turbine blades, right? In order to make those, they have some very complex shapes. 
and they may take a uh, $30,000 part and another $30,000 part out of titanium, and these things may be this big around, and they may want to weld those together. Sometimes they use electron beam welding, but sometimes the joint they want to make, you can't get a beam all the way straight down, and they actually friction weld these two things together. So you take them two $30,000 parts to create either a new $70,000 part or a piece of junk. Okay? So, if you, because there's no way to repair that friction weld if you don't get it right. Um, people have tried friction welding pipelines together. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I may not go into that. That's a little bit of a long uh, di uh, digression. But friction welding is used for that. Um, this is not friction welding, but I passed this around before. This is just a piece of polyethylene pipe for gas distribution, and they basically heat up. This is not cold welding in the sense of everything is super cold uh, or room temperature, but uh, uh, you heat up the two ends and you squeeze them together and you get the same type of, you're extruding out the contamination. Just like in the friction weld, you're spinning it and extruding it out. Here you're extruding it out because you soften the two edges and squeeze it together. Now what you didn't notice, because it didn't, or you may not have noticed, I didn't point it out before. If you look very carefully at this, you'll see that the, the pipe is a little bit narrower in diameter right around the well than it is back over here. Anybody know why that is? They heat it up, heat up the ends of the pipe, squeeze it together, and then the thing cools down. So why does it shrink in the center? Initially, it expanded in the center, so the thing was larger in diameter. I squeeze it together, and it squeezes together to where it's the original diameter, and then, it, but it's still hot, and when it cools down, it shrinks. And I end up seeing just a little bit, if you hold it up to the, away from your eye a little bit, you can kind of see the thing coming in. That joint has residual stresses in it from the thermal heating in the process. So does the friction weld, although the steel friction weld can deal with that better. One of the bigger problems with that gas pipe is not the strength of the joint, um, the, the tensile strength of the joint, that passes pretty well. It's the impact strength of the joint. Because in this case, you have polymers being squeezed together, and the polymers are not like metals or ceramics where you have individual atoms that can bond. You actually are trying to get bonds between, well, in this case, you've got polymer chains, and those polymer chains have their strong bonds down the chain, but their weak bonds are the Van der Waals bonds between the chains. <clears throat> and so if I go back to this stuff up here, at that interface, I have no chains going all the way across. I essentially, at that interface, have all Van der Waals bonds. So the interface is a little weaker. When you actually pull it in tension, you get a pretty good tensile strength. But if you hit it with something sharply in an impact strength, you find it might shear right there at the joint because I have no polymer chains going across that interface. I don't have the primary bonds of the chains pulling across there. And that's one of the things that gives the polymers their strength. Um, and I don't get that. So that's one of the difficulties of that particular type of joint. But essentially, that's not, that one's not cold welding, but it still shows you this principle of interfacial shear. Another type of joining where we use interfacial shear is ultrasonics. And that's <coughs> on that wire bond. It showed a, it said sonotrode and rather than electrode. Um, but in uh, ultrasonics, you basically start out with some, something that looks like this. And you have your part down here, or the part, this is actually an anvil that you're going to work against. And the parts you want to weld, you want to weld this interface. And this is the sonotrode, they call it. And basically, you vibrate this back and forth. Typically, you put an electromagnetic coil around here, you put a magnetostrictive material in here, you vary the magnetic field at 10 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz, uh, even 100 kilohertz. And this thing vibrates back and forth this way. Um, as it vibrates back and forth, by friction, this one is going to vibrate with respect to this one. And so I'm getting, I'm, I'm pressing down with force here. I'll have a pressure against the anvil. So I'm squeezing it down, 
but I'm getting a little bit of microscopic rubbing. It's not very high amplitude, but it's enough compared to the different the distance between the mountain peaks to wear down the mountains. And so I'm just vibrating them down rather than shearing them down. So it's a question whether I get a lot of shear in one direction or whether I get a lot of shear by vibrating back and forth and adding it up to try to wear down those mountain peaks. That's called ultrasonic welding. <coughs> Sometimes used for the wire bonding, but not usually because it takes too long. You gotta vibrate for some fraction of a second, and that's too long when you're making 10 of the 12 welds. Um, the, usually they just squeeze the, the microelectronics uh, joints together. So <coughs> essentially, this is ultrasonics. Another, this is essentially cold welding. Um, one of the problems with ultrasonics that you don't have when you do a big macroscopic shear, a big macroscopic shear like in friction welding, you're taking all the contamination and you're extruding it out of the joint. In ultrasonic welding, where does the contamination go? It just goes into the valleys in between. And the ultrasonic joint essentially might end up with a 50% joint. The joint ends up with little islands, pockets of contamination with welds in between. So it's a perforated joint, if you will. Uh, and ultrasonic joints are typically not as strong as a fully welded joint. They may be fine for sheet metal where you can get lots of surface contact area compared to the thickness of the sheet. But for bulk materials, well, you don't usually use ultrasonic welding because the joint basically has a bunch of contamination still buried at the interface. I have a true metallurgical bond in between the contamination, but I have the contamination left there. That's all except in one case, one case I know of, and I don't know that it's ever been published, but I heard about it, um, at <laughs> Sandia National Labs, they were once concerned about making a good ultrasonic joint because some of the things they build, which are things like fuses for nuclear warheads, um, are very critical, and their sonotrode electrodes had a huge radius. They wanted to weld two sheets of aluminum together but they didn't want to heat up the aluminum because it was going to damage some other part of this complex thing. So they basically came in here with a eight inch radius tip steel tool. And they basically, if you plotted the pressure versus time, they ramped the pressure over time to some value while they were vibrating this sonotron back and forth. Okay, so this thing's vibrating back and forth. It's got a downward pressure, but the downward pressure is increasing. So initially, this is rubbing this interface together, but as you increase the pressure, it would start to sweep the aluminum oxide surface contamination to the outside. As they kept on increasing the pressure, the joint was growing, starting as a small little nugget in the center of the sheet and getting bigger and bigger and sweeping the contamination out to the sides. And they got a much, much higher strength joint. The problem is only the nuclear weapons people could afford to weld that way, okay? It turns out getting an eight inch radius on a little half inch tool uh, and keeping it, not letting it in, not having it wear away means that you probably couldn't get but five or 10 welds before you had to put new tips in and everything else. Um, sort of an expensive process but they were able to essentially sweep the aluminum oxide to the outer sides and get a nearly full strength aluminum weld, uh, spot weld that way. I remember uh, uh, my example of aluminum spot welding was 20 years ago when um, they were trying to improve the fuel efficiency of cars to meet the cafe standards. People were saying, well, you ought to go to aluminum automobiles. They, uh, I went to a welding show and they had a spot welding machine for aluminum, or an ultrasonic spot welding machine for aluminum. Now, first of all, you have to understand this, <coughs> um, for aluminum sheet in automobiles, this anvil has to be pretty big. And if you're gonna reach all the way in, you know, if this is an aluminum ta a table and you're gonna make the weld way in there, and you gotta reach two feet in across the, uh, the body of the car, that anvil's gotta be pretty big. And so they had something that stood about six feet tall and weighed about 10 tons 
which was the frame for this machine that could reach in two or three feet <coughs> uh, to ultrasonically bond the aluminum together. And they were handing out little samples, uh, coupons, of two sheets of aluminum welded together. And I got one, and I threw it in my, my uh, bag and brought it back and threw it in the, uh, you know, the samples that I could kind of collect over the years. Six months later, <coughs> I went to pick it up, pick it up <coughs> and it fell apart in my hands. It was a good joint when it was made because it had the bonded areas in between the contamination. But what had happened over time was moisture had gotten in there and aluminum oxide. It had gotten in there because it's perforated and I had these areas of contamination. The moisture diffused through there and it corroded and essentially fell apart. The perforations essentially corroded themselves away and the thing fell apart. So uh, you can see why they probably didn't ever build automobiles that way, aside from the fact that you would have to move the car to the welding machine rather than the other way around. If you've ever been through an automotive assembly plant, the spot welding machines may weigh two, three hundred pounds, but you can still get a robot to take that spot welding machine and bring it to the automobile. When you have a ten ton welding machine, you have to bring the car to the machine. And so that's a little bit more difficult and a little bit more expensive, and so we don't do it that way. Um, another type of friction welding that uh, is important, or well, people want it to be important, the reason I brought the turbine blades is this is actually a land-based turbine, but this gives you an idea of how heavy the root geometry of the turbine blade can be. This is a, uh, an aircraft turbine blade. But the root geometry where the, that essentially these corrugations, they call the Christmas tree structure, because if you look at it this way, it has kind of a Christmas tree shape. It slides into the turbine wheel. And you have to have this big heavy flange on the turbine wheel in order to make that joint. This is, that, that Christmas tree structure is just a mechanical interlock. That is the joint for joining the turbine blade to the turbine disc. Well, that's, that's the heaviest part of this. I mean, if you, if you were trying to balance this, I mean, clearly the Christmas tree weighs twice as much as the rest of this blade. I mean, the balance point is way back here somewhere, right? Okay. Um, and so that adds a lot of weight to the turbine disc. And what you'd like to do is get rid of the weight because if you've already had some of the 3371 lectures, you remember that the faster something moves, the more valuable reducing the weight is. Okay, so one of the things that people want to wanted to do is the Air Force has spent millions and millions of dollars on what they call BLISC technology. So they got a big turbine disc, which may be worth seventy or hundred thousand dollars, and you got to put one hundred and fifty turbine blades around this thing. And right now, you slip them in mechanically and mechanically interlock them on this big flange, which is nice and heavy. You like to weld them, except this material is a high temperature material, and it doesn't have very good weldability per se in a fusion welding sense. And so, one of the things they've been trying is what they call linear friction welding. Most friction welding is just like that, the drive shaft where you spin the thing and a rotational part and spin the two together. But linear friction welding, they've basically built machines so that you can rub the things back and forth. And you can feel the heat with your hand. You know, if you just rub it back and forth, you're generating heat. And they're trying to generate enough heat to cause deformation and shear that will essentially allow the thing to weld together. And you can make welds uh, that way. Uh, the problem is you've got to make 150 perfect ones. Because if one of them's bad, you now have a $400,000 piece of junk, OK, um, rather than a, a good part. However, <coughs> the payoff is, and I think this was in the 3371 lecture, if you can get 20 pounds off each disk, that's 10, 200 pounds off each engine, 200 pounds each, off each engine can be 2,000 pounds off the airframe, and 2,000 pounds off the airframe can be half a million dollars savings per aircraft. 
okay, because it's about, if it's uh, $200 a pound for a commercial aircraft, for a military aircraft, it can be even more um, in terms of payload and things like that. Um, the option to repair the blades. Without the efficiency, you can repair the blades. Well, that, you mean... Usually, you don't buy a brand new blades and replace them. You just repair the old one. That's right, um, if you can, because these things are like $4,000 a piece. That's right. Um, that's why our factory is like the Chrome Alloy. Right. repair those uh, blades. Yep. Um, one by one. Right, Chrome Alloy is about a three-quarter billion dollar business. There's actually about a $5 billion worldwide business in repairing jet engine parts. Um, because they don't usually, the, the metal actually has pretty good strength, but they wear, and if you can re-weld up the worn, e worn edges and get a good part. These things tend to crack down at the bottom because that's where the maximum thermal stresses are. I, I, I can bring one in maybe if I remember next time. I have one from Chrome Alloy that, uh, where they do a braze repair down in here. And we'll talk about that type of braze repair later. Um, but you can take a $4,000 piece of scrap and turn it into a $4,000 good part for maybe only $500 worth of work. And you can then sell it for $2,000 or, right? I mean, you can get pretty good margin on these things. The problem is, um, typically, you may only be, if you try to repair 100 blades, you may only get 75 good ones. And you may end up finally totally scrapping 25% of them. But there's a, a huge market, it's about $5 billion a year. Um, and one of the problems for the, uh, the engine manufacturers, the Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney's, and General Electric's, is that this repair and extension of life of turbine parts has gotten to be so effective that they're not selling a lot of new engines now. They just recycle the old parts. Um, the turbine engine business is about 15 or $20 billion a year worldwide. Um, but the repair business is about five billion, so you know um, it's been becoming more and more effective. And some of the the commercial jets, a, you know, if you're flying on a, a commercial airline, those engines typically might go ten thousand hours between major overhaul. Now, when I was your age, and I worked in a naval air rework facility, we went five hundred hours. Now, this was 30 years ago, right? But we went 500 hours between a major overhaul on a jet engine. Now you can go 10,000. No, those are military. Military may still be only 2,000 hours. In but military, usually don't count the hours, the company cycles. cycles. Right, they actually, but it works out. I'm, I'm kind of averaging things out. Typically, um, you're right, they do count because military engines are driven much more variable. Um, on a helicopter engine, you actually count the number of cycles of high stress, they call the N1 cycles. But, but um, um, in any case, typically we've, the, the time between overhauls on those engines in the last 30 years for military engines has increased by a factor of four. Commercial aircraft are going 10,000 hours. And, you know, I, <clears throat> it, it scares me every time I think about it, but they're not all falling out of the sky. And one of the reasons they're not all falling out of the sky, you might know why they're not all falling out of the sky? because most of your jets have three or four engines, okay? And uh, I remember looking at the General Electric data once for the CF-56, which is the world's largest selling commercial aircraft engine. It's on the 737s and, and things like that. Um, and so it's a very high selling engine. And its reliability rate is something like 99.7% reliable. And by that, they meant if you're going on a two-hour trip, you're only one, one flight in 300, will that engine have to be shut down in the middle of the trip? Now, I, when I saw that, I thought, you know, if I fly on an airplane 100 times a year, and there's four engines on every one of those, that's 1,200 engines, right? Trips, okay? Or no, it's 400 engine trips. In 400 engine trips, that means on the average of once a year, when I, while I'm flying on an aircraft, the pilot is shutting down one of the engines. So they don't announce this to the, to the passengers, right? But you really only need four engines when you're taking off. You really only need one or two to land if the pilot's good, okay? Uh, but for example, I do a fair amount of failure analysis on um, 
uh, on aircraft uh, uh, crashes and stuff. And most of those are on um, what's called general aviation, small uh, personal aircraft. And I will not fly in one that is not a twin engine aircraft. Okay? There are single engine aircraft that people, you know, I, they like to fly. In fact, I was with a guy yesterday who had flown to Delaware from Maryland in his little single, single engine. I didn't ask, oh, it was a Mooney. Um, someone else was asking what his aircraft was. I refuse to fly in a single engine aircraft. Um, I've seen too many engine failures um, to want to fly. Because you only got one engine up there, it's not good, good news when you lose that. You got two engines up there and you lose an engine, if you have a good pilot, you can still land. Now, unfortunately, not everyone's a good pilot, and I've seen plenty of two engine aircraft fail too, but that's another problem. <coughs> but in any case, the time between overhauls is being extended, <coughs> and the number of parts that can be repaired and extended in their life uh, has increased significantly too. Um, it used to be that Pratt and Whitney and General Electric and Rolls Royce left that repair business to these other people because originally it was only a half billion or billion dollar business and they had 15 or 20 billion dollars worth of new engines to sell. Nowadays, their business is shrinking down to the 10 billion dollar level and here's a five billion dollar market that they haven't been in. And so there are major fights out there between the original equipment manufacturers doing repairs and these independent repairs of which there are hundreds, chromoloy being the biggest. But chromoloy is about 750 million. Yep. Question? Nah, you wouldn't feel a thing. It takes a while for them to spin down. Now, you can tell if there's an engine problem if you see a bunch of smoke coming out or flames or something. And in fact, uh, one time with my family, one February going to Disney World, we had to stop in, in Baltimore. And I'm looking out the, out the window and I see it's a foggy day, but I see some really heavy smoke. Um, kind of going over the wing uh, right next to the engine and I watched it and it wasn't just, this was not just, you know, the clouds going over because the clouds kind of go over here and then over there because the cloud is not always in the same spot over the window, uh, the wing, right? This was nice and steady. And I, uh, I mentioned to the stewardess when we landed, I said, you might want to have them check the number two engine over here because I saw smoke uh, going over the the thing as we were landing. Oh no, sir, that's 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 normal. Okay, I said, ma'am, I do about ten engine failure analyses a year. I think you really ought to do it. You know, I told her I was a professor from MIT. Oh, oh she started paying attention. Of course, I remember I was also on a commercial flight in a thunderstorm once, and uh, uh, the stewardess. This was her first time um, as a stewardess, or one of her first times, and she had just been up in the. Uh, uh, cockpit because they had St. Elmo's fire. Anybody know what St. Elmo's fire is? You didn't read no Moby Dick? St. Elmo's fire is when you're in an electrical storm, you actually can get a corona discharge. Uh, the, they used they called it St. Elmo's fire and in Moby Dick they talk about it at the top of the mast in a thunderstorm. You basically get an electrical discharge and it looks like the top of the mast is glowing. It's basically a fluorescent light, if you will, from electrical discharge. And they had that in the front of the aircraft and the pilots had called her up so she could see it. They didn't tell the rest of us. And uh, anyway, she's walking back and she starts saying, what is St. Elmo's fire? And you know, the plane's rocking back and forth in this thunderstorm. This was a like a 30 passenger jet. And uh, then we got hit with lightning. And you should have seen her jump, okay? I don't, how many people have ever been in an aircraft when they got hit with lightning? I've only been in it twice. One was a 737 and the other was this one. Oh, she jumped because it's very exciting when the aircraft gets hit with lightning. You, you know, kind of big flash of light and, and uh, big sound, right? Because you're right next to it, you know, like something just exploded. She was about to go, she's the one who's there for our safety. Right? I had to calm her down and say, we just got hit with lightning. It's okay, no problem. You know, aircraft get hit with lightning all the time. But because of the Faraday cage, you're actually safer than anywhere else. The other time, it was a very late night flight. I was going to Oak Ridge National Lab, flying into Knoxville from Atlanta. And they had delayed us until 2 a.m. seeing if the weather would clear. And finally, they decided they were going to take off. And so this 737 was full at 2, 2 o'clock in the morning. And we must have been on the glide approach into Knoxville for about 150 miles. I mean, or more than that. I mean, it, just, it was going on and on. And thunder and lightning around. And then we got hit with lightning. 
and all the, the woman in the seat behind me. In fact, they warned us that we were in a thunderstorm and, you know, and we might get hit with lightning. We got hit with lightning. And it's just a lot of noise. It's just a quick noise and a lot of light for a second. You think, you know, someone just set a bomb next to you. I, she was crawling the seat, you know, over on top of me. And I said, man, will you just sit down? It's so, it's okay, you know, just, uh, uh. anyway, she was just, she was, she was hysterical. Uh, so some people don't like bombs going off while they're flying, uh, even if they're not real bombs. I, told, I had to try to explain that we were safe. Um, and we did land, and I'm here, okay? Now, another type of cold welding, <coughs> this comes out of the welding handbook, where they want to just join aluminum wires in a, in a wire manufacturing plant, and oops, we're running over time. Um, we, they basically just push, you can't just push them together because that's just a straight normal force. They actually have the dies that actually kink the wire sideways, and you push them together, and then you kink them again, and you keep on pushing them together, and eventually you just shear off the flash, and you've extruded out the contamination. So that's enough on cold welding today. Sorry, I ran, ran over.